There's an old saying that goes a bit like this. When the going gets tough, the women pick up their telephones and call their divorce lawyers. Cooped up New Yorkers are flooding lawyer phone lines with divorce inquiries, with an avalanche of filings expected once the courts reopen. Quote, People are realizing that they can't stand each other, says Manhattan lawyer Suzanne Kimberly Bracker, who, like many in her field, has already seen a pestilence divorce uptick. In the middle of the night, I got a call from a client who now realizes she has nothing in common with her husband but the children, and how he knows nothing about the children, Bracker said of a marketing executive she reps, and, quote, she'll be damned if she spends the rest of her life with him, end quote. And, gentlemen, that's a little bit of a sample of the things that are going on right now. And we all know that relationships are difficult and marriages are even more difficult. But imagine how much more difficult it becomes when you have to spend every waking hour with each other. Now, in general, a lot of the ideas behind modern marriage are predicated on just that, this idea that you're supposed to spend a lot of time with each other. And I'll talk a little bit about that later and why that's not the case or ought not to be the case. But not just in New York, but also in places like China and Turkey, and Lincoln Lobar to various articles, the rates of divorce have been going up in light of the current pestilence. And it shouldn't really surprise anyone. In fact, these are some of the countries we have actual data on. There are probably a lot more countries that are experiencing a spike in divorce. It's just that no one's reporting on it at the moment. And it really shouldn't surprise anyone in the slightest. Anyone who's been paying attention, observing for the past few years, if not decades, and has paid attention to the data on divorce, that globally the consistent metric of approximately 70% of divorces being initiated by women, irrespective of the country, the geography, this is consistent across the globe. And it's a very safe assumption that the majority of these divorces currently being discussed, initiated, and opted for are being propelled by women. And on top of that, despite everyone's proclamations to the contrary, at least by dint of self-reporting, it seems that couples are having less and less sex in the bedroom due to the current pestilence, quarantine slash lockdown, not more. In other words, this idea that there'll be tons of babies nine months hence turns out to be just a bit of poppycock. Now, sure, there will be some. It only requires one act of copulation. But the general trend, based on limited information we do have, is that couples, married or otherwise, are having less and less sex. And I think the current crisis, if that's what you want to call it, does put the spotlight on a couple of features of human beings and more broadly marriage in general. That being a very, very clear breakaway from some of the mythology that it is enshrouded in, namely that there's something sacred about marriage or that men and women are the perfect partners to each other. Now, I've stated things similar in the past, and I'll state it again because it's a very, very important point to drive home. But men and women require each other for copulation and reproduction. They're not friends. They do not get along in the sense of friendship. They typically have vastly different interests. And marriage entered into the equation simply as a means of rearing and raising children. So the institution of marriage itself, historically and arguably prehistorically, was there to aid in raising of children. Nothing more, nothing less. It was not to fulfill each other. It was not there to create happiness between the man and the woman. It was not there to create a lifetime friendship. It was there to make sure offspring survived and were set into the world whereupon they themselves could reproduce. And that's the bottom line behind marriage. It's why for untold centuries, most people were acutely aware that marriage was an economic union. Because in some of these articles, it's pointed to correctly that, in fact, most marriages break down along lines of financial trouble. And these days, given the current situation, there's a lot of anxiety, and specifically financial anxiety, in particular amongst couples. And when women start worrying about their finances, who are they going to blame? Of course, we know who they're going to blame. So I think when we get a situation like we currently have with the global pestilence, it's pretty eye-opening. Because what you typically get is a vindication of a lot of ideas and theories that were almost certainly true, but then you get actual empirical evidence to back up what you thought. Now, I don't believe that marriage as an institution is going to disappear as a consequence of this. But if I have any hope here, it's that the current crisis should shed some light on the institution of marriage for a lot of people, specifically men, 
that they know the risks, that they know it is indeed a very dangerous bargain, and if they want to pursue it, they need to be aware of all the consequences surrounding it. But most importantly, that all people, both men and women, be aware of what marriage is. It is an institution that was put into place to aid in the raising of children. It's a business contract of sorts, and the business they're engaging in is reproduction. It's not a friendship. It's not about true love. It's not even about getting along beyond getting along for the sake of the children. And that snippet I mentioned, the quotation from the New York Post article, is very indicative. The only thing this woman has in common with her husband are the children. But in the vast majority of cases, that's the case, that the only thing the woman has in common with the husband are the children. But what can you say to that? Duh, it's pretty obvious. The reason why marriage exists is for the sake of children. It's not because the wife enjoys the football game or the baseball game or working on the car and the garage or playing video games or because the husband enjoys sewing or knitting or gossiping with his friends at a table in some cafe, drinking latte. No, the marriage is there for the sake of the children. It's not there, I repeat, for the happiness of the people involved. And I think this is the light at the end of the tunnel. If at least some number of quote-unquote couples could come to the realization that their happiness is not very important in the context of marriage, that this idea that you're supposed to love the other person, that you're supposed to be, above all, supremely content in a marriage, flies in the face of historical evidence and flies in the face of the actuality we face today, meaning, in fact, that we wouldn't have all these divorces if women could come to terms with the reality of marriage. Did you know the most common reason cited, generally speaking? It's simply discontent, not being happy. Sure, there are other reasons, and some of them might even be legitimate, but they're not the most common reasons. And perhaps we can learn from the current crisis, and people who decide to engage in marriage for the sake of propagation of DNA can learn from this crisis and realize that ultimately they're not there to be happy. They're there to stick together for the sake of of raising children who themselves will grow up to copulate and reproduce in like manner and engage in similar behaviors. But of course the issue here is people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear the harsh reality that marriage is a reproductive economic business contract. They want to hear that it involves love and trust and all this mystical mumbo jumbo. But when the going gets tough, we see what happens. We see women wanting to file for divorce. We see economic anxiety. We see all these myths that are typically floated about in the mainstream crumble into nothingness because the myths themselves are built on castles of sand. It's just hocus pocus and nonsense. Marital relationships have always been about finances and they are the bedrock, the backbone, and nearly everything. We can only hope that many people learn many lessons as a result of this crisis, but especially with respects to marriage, the realization that marriage is either not what it's cracked up to be or it is what it's cracked up to be in the sense of a reproductive economic business contract used to usher in progeny in order to raise them to the point where they themselves can reproduce and follow in suit. Now, on a final note, and perhaps the most salient and important point to drive home, what we can observe here is a good piece of evidence to suggest that men and women did not evolve to spend copious amounts of time with each other beyond the necessities of copulation and reproduction and some interaction. No, females were doing what they were doing, males were doing what they were doing, they had different tasks, they had a different partitioning of jobs they had to execute for the sake of survival and reproduction. And we even see this in the case of work. Jordan Peterson was famously asked if men and women can work together he offered a lopsided but somewhat honest answer of, we don't know, in all likelihood he was trying to cover his tracks. I think the answer is much more likely that they cannot work together, at least very well in most cases. And what do you get when you have men and women who are in relationships and marriage that are forced to spend all day with each other? Well, you get the current situation with the rise in divorce, the lockdown, the realization that these women can't stand their husbands. Anyway, gentlemen, I thought this was very topical given the rises in divorce due to you-know-what. And if I'm still alive, I'll check you out later. Until the next time, may the gods watch over you. And bye -bye. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, 
please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.